Film photography can seem so intimidating, but don't worry, I'm here to take away the mystery and give you all the information you need to get started in taking your own photographs on film. I tried to make this video as easy as possible to follow, so I've split it up into different sections, which you can see the timestamps for each section here, and I've included these timestamps in the description below, so you can click on one of them and jump to exactly what you want to learn about. Keep in mind this is a general introduction to film photography, and I do have other videos that are on specific cameras like the Canon AE-1, the Pentax K1000, the Nikon F3, and others, so this video is meant to complement those. I will put links to those down in the description below. So what is film and how does it work? Well, film is a recording medium for light, so instead of using a digital sensor, it uses chemical means to record the light information. Film is essentially a piece of plastic that has a very thin microscopic layer of gelatin on it, and suspended within that gelatin are light-sensitive granules. For black and white film, it's what are called silver halide crystals. These crystals interact with light that falls upon it, and then we can use other chemicals to wash away the silver that hasn't reacted, and thus we get a film negative. Color film works in the same way. Instead of having one layer, it has three layers, each layer sensitive to either red, green, or blue light. So the two main formats of film that you're likely to start with are 35 millimeter film, which comes in this kind of canister, and looks like this once it's developed, and medium format film, which comes rolled up around a spool and when developed, looks like this. Here you can see the 35 millimeter used in a 3D camera called the Nishika N8000. Uh, here you can see it used in a regular SLR. Here for the medium format, this is the same film used in three different cameras, allowing for three different sizes of photographs. This is what's known as a 645, this is a 6x9, and this is a 6x6. So the physical size of these microscopic granules are what determine the film's sensitivity to light. The larger these microscopic granules, the more likely that photons will hit them, and thus it doesn't take as much light in order to produce an image. This is what's called ISO or ISO. It doesn't really matter how you say it, no one who is important cares. Uh, the thing to remember is that it's uh, conveyed by this number here. So 100 is one of the most common ISOs. There's a trade-off. The lower the ISO, the higher the quality of the image. The higher the ISO, the less light you need in order to record an actual photograph. So here you can see this color film has an ISO of 400, which means it will be easier to take a photo in lower light conditions, but you are more likely to see the grain in the photograph because the granules are literally larger. 400 ISO is literally four times as sensitive to light as 100 ISO. There are even color films like Fujifilm Superior 1600, which I'm not sure is made anymore, but you can still find this and similar films for very high ISO color photography. Most 35 millimeter film cartridges have what's called DX coding, which is this barcode and these silver and black squares in a certain arrangement here on the canister. If your camera has contacts in it where the cartridge goes that look like this, then it's able to read the DX coding and set the ISO itself. So if you are buying film for your camera, you're probably asking yourself, what film should I buy? The first choice you have is between black and white and color. Black and white tends to be a little more forgiving when it comes to exposure and developing, whereas color gives you more information. You can always take a color photograph and after you scan it digitally, you can turn it into a black and white photograph. The next question to ask yourself is do you want a low ISO film that's very high quality or a higher ISO film that's easier to shoot in lower light situations but can leave a lot of grain? If you're really not sure which ones to start with, some easy ones to recommend are Ilford HP5, Kodak Tri-X, Fujifilm Superior, and Kodak Gold. So how does a camera actually work? Let's get back to basics. This is a pinhole camera, the simplest camera you can possibly have. It's a box which you can open. Now in this box what you do is you'll put a piece of film back here and on the opposite side is a hole. So once you've loaded your camera and you're ready to take your exposure you take a light reading with what's called a light meter. Most cameras have light meters built into them. This one obviously does not so you would need to use a handheld meter but most of the time you can just use the one in your actual camera. 
That will allow you to determine how long the shutter door, which on this camera is this big door right here, stays open. And since this is a pinhole camera, we can see our little pinhole right there. And that pinhole is the aperture, meaning the circular opening that the light goes through. That light is then projected through the camera onto the light sensitive material, whether that be film or a digital sensor and is recorded. Now this is closer to the kind of camera you'll actually be using. We of course have our lens. And if we open up the back of our camera here, we can see we have our shutter door. If we take the lens off our camera, it can be easier for us to see the aperture inside. So as a photographer, it's your job to decide how big is this aperture opening and how long does that shutter door stay open? This is the way in which we control the light that lands on the film, known as the exposure. And it's called the exposure because we are exposing the film to light. So as I said before, most film cameras do have light meters built in, but not all of them. If the camera does have a light meter, it will likely require a battery and you will be able to use the light meter by looking through the viewfinder and seeing different indicators based on the brand of camera that you're using. So because we are recording light in a controlled way by using the camera to control the amount of light falling on the film, as a photographer, we have to be able to talk about uh, the amount of light that we're letting into the camera in a specific way. This is where the concept of a stop of light comes in. If you are increasing your exposure by one stop of light, that means you are doubling the amount of light that comes into the camera. If you are reducing your exposure by one stop, it means you are cutting the amount of light coming into the camera by half. So the concept of a stop of light can apply to the aperture, it can apply to the ISO, and it can apply to shutter speed, but it's easiest to understand when talking about shutter speed. So shutter speed is in intervals of time, specifically fractions of a second. So if I have my dial here set to 60 on this camera, it means one 60th of a second, meaning the shutter door will be open for that period of time. If I increase uh, my exposure by one stop, that means I'm doubling the amount of light coming into the camera, and I can do that by doubling the amount of time that the shutter door remains open. So I go from 1 60th of a second to 1 30th of a second. If I go the other way and reduce my exposure by one stop, that means I am cutting the amount of light in half. So in this case, it would actually be 1 20th of a second, but the next setting on the camera is 1 25th. So it's really close to one stop. But let's say I go two stops. I double the amount of light coming into the camera, so 1 30th of a second, and I double it again by going to 1 15th of a second. So now I'm letting in four times as much light as I was at 1 60th of a second, but that's two stops. And it goes the same the other way for reducing the amount of light at 1 250th of a second. So what kind of film camera should you get to start off? Well, that really depends on your preference. There are quite a few choices, and the first one is disposable cameras. Disposable cameras are one-time use cameras that have the film preloaded in them. They have a single lens that's of a fixed zoom, which is usually about 35 millimeters, so a little wide. Some of the advantages of having a disposable camera are that it is not an investment. They're fairly inexpensive. They're easy to use. As long as you have enough light, you can take some pretty decent photographs. It'll give you a taste of film. Disadvantages are that you can't change lenses. It doesn't do well in low light. The lens is small and not particularly sharp. It looks okay, but it's not nearly as nice as actual nice glass you might put on an SLR camera. But all in all, a disposable camera can be a lot of fun and a great way to just experiment with film if you're not sure about getting your own film camera. The next category of camera are cameras like this, what are called point and shoot cameras. Some advantages are they're fairly inexpensive, they're pretty easy to find, they tend to have more features than you would think they do, they largely shoot on automatic. Some disadvantages are it's unlikely you'll find one that allows you manual control over the camera. They're small enough like a disposable to be able to fit in your pocket or a small bag. And gosh darn it, don't they just look so cool. So some cool things that these cameras have. So this one has a weird filter that like flips down to make things softer. And this one, this Pentax, actually has a time-lapse mode. Now most likely you will be using what's called an SLR camera. 
An SLR camera is an interchangeable lens camera, so you can change the focal length or zoom of your camera. Also, they're probably what you think of when you think of film cameras. Nice things about them is that they are very versatile. They are pretty plentiful still. They tend to give you great photographs. They're fairly easy to use. There's not a lot of downsides. They're a little bigger, a little heavier. They tend to cost more, typically anywhere between $50 to $150 for a camera and a single lens. But prices can vary and change, especially with the resurgence of film. Now what does SLR or single lens reflex mean? Well, it means that a single lens is used both for the viewfinder and to expose the film to light. It does this with the help of this mirror here. So when you actually take a photo, the mirror lifts up out of the way. So let me do one second exposure. So there you can see that the mirror lifts up out of the way and the shutter door opens to expose the film in the back to light. Now this is different from what's called a TLR or twin lens reflex. This is where it has two lenses. The top one is used for the viewfinder, which is up here. And then the bottom one is used to actually expose the film to light. Another type of camera you can get is an automatic SLR, like this Pentax ZX30. So this camera has all the advantages of being an SLR, and then it has interchangeable lenses, so you can make the focal length whatever you want, but it has a ton of automatic features, which is really nice. They also tend to be pretty inexpensive. I got this ZX30 for, I believe it was $30, and then this battery pack that lets me use double A's with it for another $10. These cameras can be awesome to start out with because they have a full auto mode. They have all these presets, portrait, landscape, macro, sports, nighttime, turning the flash off. Oh yeah, and they often have a built-in flash, which is really nice. They'll also have manual and semi-automatic settings as well. And not to mention autofocus. Autofocus is awesome on a film camera. Now, if anybody tries to make you feel bad that you're shooting a more automatic film camera than a manual one, tell them to be quiet. So where should you buy your camera? Your best bet is a local camera store, but if they don't have the selection you want, there's always online. Amazon, of course, is one. Uh, KEH.com is another good one. They specialized in only used photography gear and the use section of B&H Online. So let's talk more about the shutter. The shutter is one of the primary ways that you as a photographer control how the light comes into the camera. So this right here is the shutter door. On this camera, the shutter door is made of silk, although it's often made of very, very thin uh, slats of metal, of aluminum, uh, that move out of the way. So here when I take a photo, you can see the shutter door gets out of the way. And then when I advance the film, which is what these spinning things are, would be doing, you can see it resets the shutter door as well. So the way you control the shutter on any camera is shutter speed. So you decide the duration of time that that shutter door stays open. And this is usually in fractions of a second. Now that picture I just took, you can see the shutter speed is set to one, meaning one full second. If I set it to two, that means one half, four means one fourth, and so on. This particular camera, the Pentax K1000, goes all the way up to one one thousandth of a second. Now as with all things in photography, there is a trade-off here as you change the shutter speed. The less amount of time the shutter is open, the less light comes into the camera. But you need a certain amount of light in order to expose the film correctly and actually make a photograph. So that's the primary thing that happens when you change the shutter speed. But there's a secondary effect of changing the shutter speed. And that is making a object that is moving uh, either seem to stand still or make it blurry. So by using faster shutter speeds, you will freeze movement much more easily than using lower shutter speeds. If you use a slow shutter speed, like one full second or more, then you will have streaking because you're getting light from the object here, 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 as it moves across the frame. You're recording all that light. For those of you curious, the B represents bulb mode. That basically means as long as I hold down the shutter button, the shutter will stay open. So I can have it be open for as long as I like. So next let's talk about the second control you have, the aperture. So inside the lens is an iris, which we call the aperture. And this works just like the iris of your eye. It opens up to let in more light and goes down to let in less light. So in the way that 
fractions of a second are the settings for the shutter door, f-stops are the settings for the aperture. So here we can see these numbers on this dial represent the f-stop settings. So as I turn this dial, it changes the size of the aperture. So an f-stop is usually represented by the letter f, a slash, and then one of these numbers. The actual meaning of an f-stop is as a ratio between the diameter of this aperture opening versus the focal length of the lens. So for example, if I set my f-stop to f4, I get an aperture of this size with a specific diameter. f4 means that for this particular lens, this diameter, this distance right here from edge to edge of the opening, it takes four of those distances to go the focal length of the lens. So this is why the f-stops are inverted in terms of lower numbers mean bigger openings. So if I switch it to f2, which is the largest aperture this lens can do, it's a larger diameter, a longer length between the edges of the opening. So then it only takes two of those to go the focal length of the lens. So besides letting in more or less light, the aperture also has a secondary effect the way the shutter has a secondary effect. This is what's called depth of field. Essentially what depth of field is talking about is the amount of things in focus. So if I have a large aperture like the f2 I was just using, and I took a picture of say my hand at the right distance, there's a certain amount of things that will be in focus in front of and behind my hand. If I'm at f2, very little is gonna be in focus. I'm going to have what's called a narrow depth of field. So the amount of space in front of and behind my subject is very narrow. But as I close the aperture down to say f22, and I would take the same picture, then everything or most everything in front of and behind my hand or the subject of the photograph is going to be in focus. So as you can see, using a larger aperture gives you those blurred out backgrounds most commonly referred to as bokeh. This can help isolate a subject from the background, especially if that background doesn't look very good. Or if that background is filled with lights, you can get some really cool uh, background orbs. So to help you understand depth of field a little bit better, let's talk about the markings on the lens because they're here to help guide you. Turning the lens like this changes the focus. And you can see all these numbers on the lens. So here you can see feet and meters. These are of course representing the distances in English and metric measurements. But just below that, you can see all these different numbers and the numbers are mirrored on each side with an orange marking in the middle here. So if you look, you can see these numbers correspond to the aperture settings. You can see four, eight, 16, 22 on both sides. So this is actually a depth of field guide depending on where your focus is. So let's say your subject is four feet from the camera and let's say your aperture is set to F Eight. Well, if you look, you can see an eight on this side and an eight on this side. So this is telling you approximately what distance in front of your main subject and behind your main subject will be in focus. Anything in front of say looks like about three and a half feet and anything further away than five feet will be out of focus. But anything between say five and three and a half feet at F8 when you're focused at four feet away will be in focus. So let's talk about lenses. Lenses have what's called a focal length. So that is measured in millimeters, which you can see here. So the focal length refers to the zoom level of the lens. A 50 millimeter lens on a regular 35 millimeter camera gives you a zoom level that's approximately the same to the human eye, just way more narrow and cropped in. Sometimes you'll see lenses that have a single focal length like this one. That means it's a single zoom level. You can't change it. If you want the subject to appear bigger in your frame, you have to get physically closer. The actual physical focal length of a lens is technically the distance approximately from the front of the lens to where the light comes out the back and converges. If you have a zoom lens, you'll see multiple focal lengths, both the minimum and the maximum listed on the lens. The higher the focal length number, the more zoomed in the lens will be. The lower the focal length number, the more wide angle the lens will be. 
Some things you'll also see on the lens are you'll often see a one with a colon and then a number. So in this case, it's two. This is referring to the maximum aperture performance that this lens can do. So one colon two, that means a maximum f-stop of f2. And if we look here, we can see it's f2. For this lens, we can see it's a one colon four dash 5.6. This is referring to the maximum aperture performance both at 70 millimeters and 300 millimeters as it changes. So even if we have this lens at its maximum aperture of f4 here, but then we zoom it out, what we're doing is we're making the focal length of the lens longer and thus changing the ratio between the aperture opening and the length of the lens. So the f-stop changes. As far as focusing, a lens will either be only manual focus, like this one is here, or it will have the ability to do autofocus with most older lenses that do autofocus relying on a motor inside the camera, although some uh, later models will rely on a motor in the lens itself. You can usually find a switch like this one here to switch between manual focus and autofocus if you have an automatic camera. So how do you load film into one of these cameras? Well, if it's a more traditional SLR like this, it will almost certainly have the rewind knob here where you can lift it up and open up the back of the camera. You'll then take your film cartridge, insert it into the left side. You can push down the rewind knob to hold it in place. You'll then take your film tab here and pull it out so that you have enough slack to be able to take this tab and put it into the take-up spool through one of these slots. You wanna make sure to get that tab all the way through the take-up spool. Next, you can go ahead and advance the film. So once I know that that's wound correctly and it's in there, I'm going to close the back of my camera, push down the rewind knob, and next I'm going to turn my rewind knob clockwise in order to make sure that there's tension on the film. So what this is doing is it's winding the film in the cartridge just to make it tight. That way, when I advance my lever next, this will turn counterclockwise, and that way I know that the film's advancing. So here on my camera, I also have a counter, so I can take photos and advance the film until I reach zero. Now the last thing you want to make sure to do is set the ISO. On an older film camera like this, it's not going to know what the film sensitivity is. So for the black and white film I just loaded, it is 100 ISO, which on older cameras is also represented by ASA. So here you can see I have a little 400 here. The way this works is I pull up and change it that way. So then you should be ready to go. Now if you have a more automatic film camera like the ZX30 here, it's a little different. You'll probably find a switch similar to this on the side to open it up. It will also probably have a little window here to let you know if there's already some film in there. If there is already film in there and you want to rewind it, this symbol right here is a pretty universal symbol for rewinding film. You can take a paper clip and you can push that button and it will force the camera to rewind the film all the way back into the canister regardless of how many photos have been taken. So you can open up the back of the camera by pulling down there. Then take your film, same thing, you'll load it into the left side. And if you look, you can see there's almost always some kind of marking on this side showing you where the camera wants the film tab to be. So you'll take this film tab and here I'm going to insert it so the tab is right there. So here you can see that there are little hooks that have grabbed on to the sprocket holes. The film tab is laying exactly where the indicator says it should. And you can close the back of the camera and you're good to go. So let's talk a little bit about composing your photographs before you take them. When you're looking through the viewfinder, the very first thing you should do is check the edges of the viewfinder. The important thing to keep in mind is that the photograph you take in the camera is not the final photograph. You are recording the information you need to make the final photograph. So you should always leave just a little bit of room all around the edges 
for the photograph you actually have in mind to be able to crop it out later exactly how you want. Giving yourself this extra space can be extremely helpful and make it way easier to get that final photo you want. The most common type of composition is center, meaning the subject is directly in the middle of the photograph. Now, this can make for some excellent photographs. There's no reason to shy away from it. It is tried and true. The next method of composition is rule of thirds. This is where you can split the photograph into thirds, both horizontally and vertically. And at the intersection of these thirds, you can place your subject. Another type of composition technique is leading lines, where you have lines going from the front of the photograph to the back of the photograph in some way, leading the viewer's eye along that line. Keep in mind, there are a lot of different ways to compose a photograph. These are just some of the most common and well-known. So let's talk about P, S, A, M, or in this camera, green smiley face, T, V, A, V, and M. So these are settings that you will see on pretty much any modern DSLR or a nicer electronic SLR film camera. What do they mean? Well, program means fully automatic. S or TV, meaning time value, means shutter priority, meaning you choose the shutter speed and the camera will choose the aperture. It's a semi-automatic setting. The other semi-automatic setting is a or AV, aperture value, meaning aperture priority, meaning you choose the aperture and the camera chooses the shutter speed. And manual is where you are controlling both the aperture and the shutter speed and they will be exactly what you set them to and the camera won't mess with them at all. A lot of electronic cameras also have these preset modes. These are pretty universal symbols. So you'll see portrait, landscape, this little flower pretty much always means macro or close up shot. A running guy means sports. You have nighttime, and then another one where the flash just never goes off. It can be fun to experiment around with these to see if they give you the results you want, or if you're not familiar yet or practiced enough with the manual settings, you can try these out. So let's say you're on the program or green smiley face mode, and you want to change the brightness level of your photograph, but you don't really know how to use the manual settings yet. Well, don't worry, there is a setting that allows you to change the brightness levels without you having to know anything. That's called exposure compensation, and it's represented by this square with a plus and a minus symbol in it. So what you can do is you can find the button on the camera that has that same symbol, which is right here. I can hold this down, this button, and then I can change my exposure compensation, which is here. So at zero, that means that the camera will expose the way it thinks it should, which right now is 250th of a second at f6.7. But let's say I want the photo to be darker. I can just go negative one stop, negative two stops, two and a half, or I can go the other way. Plus one stop, plus two stops, plus three stops. So you can see 125th of a second at 3.5. It's slowing, it's letting the shutter stay open longer. It's opening up the aperture because I'm trying to make it brighter. The only thing to keep in mind, and this is really important, is that the camera will stay there. It will stay at three stops overexposed if you don't change it back to zero. So don't forget that you've done exposure compensation, otherwise your entire roll could be overexposed. So I'm sure you're saying to yourself, well, okay, I understand what the shutter is, I understand what the aperture is, and I know I can change them, but what do I change them to if I'm shooting in full manual? Well, that's where the light meter inside the camera comes in. In this camera, the light meter is represented by a needle that will move up and down, indicating the amount of light coming to the camera based on the current shutter speed and aperture settings you have selected. So as you manipulate the different settings of shutter speed and aperture, the light meter peg goes up and down with the goal of getting that light peg in the middle, indicating that the correct amount of light has, is entering the camera during the, the photo in order to get a correct exposure. So this is the time in which you have to think about things like, okay, well, it's darker, so I could let in more light by slowing down the shutter, keeping it open longer, but I need to make sure that if my shutter speed goes too slow, that I'm either sitting really still when I take that photo, the subject isn't moving necessarily, unless a blurry subject is what I want, or I'm using a tripod. With the aperture, same thing. You go, well, I can let in more light 
by opening up the aperture using a lower f-stop number. Or I could let in less light by doing a bigger f-stop number and a smaller aperture. The trade-off being that more or less of the photo is in focus. So if you're taking a landscape shot, having a wide open aperture isn't necessarily a good idea because not a lot is going to be in focus. It's just going to be focused on the one thing your lens is focused on and everything to the horizon behind that will be out of focus. So you can use a lower f-stop number. But then that lets in less light. So you go, okay, well I need to compensate by making the shutter stay open longer. It's this balance. This is, this is exactly what photography is. As a photographer, you are balancing all these considerations of what you want the photo to look like, how much light there is, what your camera is capable of doing in terms of letting in light. That's what it means to be a photographer. For unloading film on an electronic camera, once the roll of film reaches the last picture, it will actually rewind itself and you'll be able to easily hear it. It'll be kind of loud. As I stated before, you can always rewind the film anytime you want by looking for this symbol on your camera and using a paper clip to hit that button to force the camera to rewind uh, when you want. If you're using a more traditional camera like this to rewind the film, you'll wait until you get to the end of the roll and then you'll hit the rewind release button here. Just push that in. And then the rewind knob, flip that out and then you'll turn it clockwise and you'll be able to feel the film going to the canister. Once you reach the point at which you're not really getting any resistance, then the film should be all the way back in the canister and you can pop open the camera and take out your film. So you've taken all your photos, you've unloaded your film, now it's time to get it developed. If you get it developed by somebody else, that's the easiest way, it's definitely more expensive, usually about 10 to 15 dollars a roll and this is what you'll get back is negatives cut and put into a sleeve of some kind now you can also get digital scans which i recommend but getting actual prints can be nice too getting actual prints which 4x6 is the most common format that you'll get uh, the lab will crop and color balance your prints for you so they'll look the best they can look. Now speaking honestly, if you develop your own film using equipment like this developing tank here, it will save you a lot of money, especially if you're going to be using film on a regular basis. There's a big misunderstanding that you need a dark room in order to develop your own film and that is not true at all. You don't need a dark room. You only need a dark room if you are developing uh, photos, making your own prints. That's when you need a dark room. But to develop film, no, you don't need a dark room for that. In fact, I have an entire video on how to develop black and white film at home. I will put a link up here in the right and in the description so you don't miss it. And color film development is actually almost identical to black and white film development. It's just that you use different chemicals and color film tends to be a little bit more temperamental in terms of timing and temperature. But otherwise, they're basically identical. Once you have your film scanned into your computer, you can edit it digitally without having to buy any editing software. So some free options are Adobe Photoshop Express, which is a free software program. You do have to create an Adobe account in order to download it and they do try to get you to buy the actual software within that software, but it's a great way to just get started with basic photo editing. It's very user-friendly. If you want something more advanced that's also free, there's GIMP. GIMP is an open source photo editing software that is basically a Photoshop alternative, and it's very powerful, although it can be complicated. So, those are two options that are free. So you can try either one of those out for editing your photos digitally. As far as needed accessories, a cleaning kit's always a good idea with a microfiber cloth, a brush, and a blower. I will link down below to a Geotis brand cleaning kit, which I can easily recommend. If you're interested in an entry-level tripod, there are a lot of tripods that are $25 or $30. I would steer clear of those. Instead, I recommend the Slick U8000. It usually costs around $45, and it is a great entry-level tripod. It is quality. It's not going to break on you. It's not going to fall apart. It's easy to use uh, and easy to recommend. 
So listen, once you start shooting with one of these cameras, you are going to make mistakes. You're gonna mess up, you're gonna lose rolls of film, things are gonna go wrong, you're gonna have light leaks, whatever. Don't worry about it, that's normal. Making mistakes with these kind of cameras is understandable. Keep in mind that photography is a lot different from the way it used to be. It used to be something that took a lot of effort uh, for you to get a great photograph. These days, with digital cameras, and artificial intelligence software, it can take a great photo for you by just pushing a button, but film's a little harder. So don't be discouraged if you mess up. In fact, you should expect to mess up. Plan for it. But once you do get the hang of things, it can be extremely rewarding. Also know that whatever camera you get, there's going to be a learning curve for it. And if you switch to a different camera, it will take a little while to start taking good photos with a new different camera. If you practice enough, you'll get to the point where you won't even have to look most of the time down at the controls. You'll just have them memorized by feel and be able to focus more on the composition and getting the exact photo you want. My final piece of advice is when in doubt, hit the shutter button. Don't hesitate. Don't treat film as some precious commodity. There's still a lot of it. You can still buy it for fairly cheap. Just shoot, 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 shoot. So thanks for watching my video. I hope this has helped you out in getting started in film photography. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section down below. And if you feel I've deserted, I'd love to get a thumbs up. And if you're interested in film photography or film cameras, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for watching.